with you today, and I want to thank Steve and Mike and Troy and all those who tried to help me uh, get ready for the message as we share together in God's Word today. I hope that every one of you got a handout. If you haven't yet received one, I think maybe John uh, Swain back there has one. They kind of look like this. Any, anybody that doesn't have one, raise your hand, and he'll make sure that you get one. We're going to talk today about a topic that I think is crucially important as we make preparations to meet the Lord. You know, it says in the book of Amos, prepare to meet thy God. And uh, one of these days, this journey of life is going to be over, and we're going to be before him. Now, aren't you thankful, those of us who have been saved, that your sins are under the blood, and that you're forgiven through the work that Jesus did upon the cross. But you know, there's still going to be an accountability before the Lord for the way that we've lived for him after we were saved. And I, I love this little quote at the top of the handout I gave you. I'll just read it. Daniel Webster at one time considered the greatest living American was asked at a banquet being held in his honor, what is the greatest thought that has ever entered your mind? Without hesitation, he replied, my accountability to God. That's a sobering thought, isn't it? Our accountability to God. And so I have before you here today, I think, uh, Troy's been helping me to get this up. Sometimes the technology doesn't work the way you want it to. But we're talking about the account that we must give. And I want to make it clear that there are uh, judgments in the Bible that do not relate to believers. There's, there's the judgment of the great white throne judgment. You can read about that in uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 20. And that is a judgment for those who are unsaved. That is a judgment for those who have never been born again through faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior. It says the books were open, and one of the books that will be opened is the Lamb's Book of Life. And all of those unsaved people, their name is not in that book, and therefore they'll be lost for all of eternity. I'm not talking about that judgment here today. You know, I'm talking about the judgment for those in the church age, that are saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to talk a lot about today works. But you know, our works have nothing to do with our salvation. I heard an interesting quote the other day. I went to hear a preacher friend of mine on a Wednesday night Bible study, and he shared a quote I'd never heard before. He said, when it comes to our salvation... God the Father bought it. Jesus Christ the Son bought it. The Holy Spirit wrought it. And by God's grace, I got it. Now you think about that. It was all the work of God from eternity past. And it's only by His grace that we got it. And so... I hope we understand that when we talk about the judgment seat of Christ, I'm not talking about works that get you to heaven. I'm talking about works that we do to honor our Savior after we're already saved. Our eternal salvation is not in question here. The question is, what are we doing for the one who died for us? The judgment seat of Christ, if I can have that next slide up there, Troy, the judgment seat of Christ is only mentioned two times in the Bible, in Romans chapter 14, 10, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. And I'll just turn around here and read it with you. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted. And that word literally means well-pleasing to him. Our acceptance is already secured through the blood of Jesus Christ. It talks about 
the fact that we are already accepted in the beloved if we're saved. But that word accepted has the idea of well-pleasing to him. As Christians, are we living in a way that's pleasing to the Father? For we must, all believers, appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11. The other one here in Romans 14, But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. That's the uh, uh, two references in the Bible to the uh, judgment seat of Christ, or the Bema seat of Christ. I want to look at that, if we can have the next slide, from three different perspectives here today. And this is the beginning of your handout. As we consider the judgment seat of Christ, let's use these three perspectives, three things I want us to consider as we think about this. The first one, Troy, is the certainties of this judgment. The certainties of this judgment. You know, sometimes we say something is possible or probable or likely or supposedly it might happen. We're not talking in that realm at all. I read it twice there in the passages we just looked at. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. There's some things in the Bible that are absolutely essential, mandatory, and certain. I think about it in terms of salvation. Jesus said, ye must be born again. If that doesn't happen in your life, you're not going to get to heaven. Um, it talks about in John chapter uh, 4, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And it, it talks about he that cometh to God must first believe that he is, must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. There's things in the Bible that are mandatory. That word must is used. And in both of these passages we just looked at, all believers must appear at the judgment seat of Christ. So this is a, a certainty, not something that's dubious or doubtful, but it's a, a fact. I heard about an English teacher who was very um, careful about his use of the English language, and he got a text from his bank that said, your account appears to be overdrawn. And he texted back and he said, let me know when you're absolutely certain. It appears to be overdrawn. Well, is it or isn't it? And so he says, let me know when you're absolutely certain. So this is something that's absolutely certain. The first of these certainties, Troy, there's two clicks there. I, I kind of remind you up front. It will certainly be an individual event. You know, the passages I read there say, every one of us must appear to give an account of who? Himself. Himself. When we get to the judgment seat of Christ, I'm not going to have to give an account for Mike Farmer or for Mike, I can't remember your last name, or Troy, or I'm not going to have to give an account for Nancy or your pastor, Bill. There's only one person I'm going to have to give an account for when I stand before the Lord at the judgment seat, and that's moi, me. Each one of us is going to give an account of himself. It's an individual um, event. 
Each one of us will stand there and give an account of ourselves. I've, I've got 10 grandchildren. Kind of interesting to sometimes watch them uh, in their daily activities. Seems like they're always fighting. And if you go and ask them, who did that? Well, it was, it was Noah or it was Miriam. It's always somebody else. It's never, I, I did it. I'm guilty. I'm responsible. I'm sorry. You never hear that. Because of our sin nature, we have an ingrained propensity to always blame somebody else. I heard about a teacher who confronted a teenage boy that was always causing trouble in the classroom and never seemed to want to own up for his guilt in it. And the teacher said to him, you have a problem with avoiding personal responsibility. And the kid replied, yeah, and whose fault is that? He still wasn't going to own up to it. And I heard about a, a, a coach, football coach, who was asking his uh, players on his team, he said, why is teamwork essential? And one of the kids spoke up and said, so we always have somebody else to blame. And that's not the point of that at all. But the fact of the matter is that when we get there, you're just going to have to stand and give an account of one person, and that's yourself. When I was a boy, there used to be a TV show I'm going to really date myself on this. Some of you will remember, and most of you won't. There was a TV program. It ran from 1952 to 1958. It was called Superman. And George Reeves was the guy who played Superman. It was in black and white before we had color TV. And one of the Super abilities that Superman had was X-ray vision. He could see right through you. You know, most courts in our land today, the lawyers are busy trying to spin the fact, spin the details, the guilt of the party that they're representing. Uh, they do everything they can to conceal anything that might be derogatory toward their client. But I'll tell you what, when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the one seated upon the throne is the one I read about in Revelation chapter 1 that has eyes like a flame of fire. And he knows all about us. He tells me in Hebrews chapter 4, all things are naked and open before him with whom we have to do. And so I think about the fact that when we're there before the Lord, you can't hide anything. He knows us through and through. I was thinking about this driving up here today, this great passage in the book of Psalm 139. Give me just a second here, I'll find it. Psalm 139. And uh, it says this. Think about us standing before the Lord. And he says in Psalm 139, verse 1, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. You think, I know myself. No, you don't. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We don't begin to know the depths of our own depravity. Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsittings and my uprising. Thou understandest my thoughts afar off. Thou compassed my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. You can't hide anything from God. And the psalmist ends it by saying, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. It's going to be an individual judgment and uh, we need to realize that you can't hide anything from God. I used to know a fella that had a whole pile of these. In fact, my brother has some, he told me, in his basement, a whole sack full of little round discs, and they had written on them, round to it. 
You ever see some, some of those people sometimes you'll say, well, I, I'm going to get around to it. And he'll pull it out of his pocket and hand you one. So, well, there it is. Now's the time. Instead of saying, I'm going to get around to it, you need to deal with things now. Because I want to tell you, this is not only an individual event where you're going to have to give an account before the Lord, but the next two up there, Troy, it's an imminent event. In other words, I don't know when it's going to happen. None of us do. But I know this, that nothing stands in the way of the Lord's return today. It could happen before I finish this sermon this morning. Uh, it seems like the Lord's uh, uh, waiting a long time as it is. The Lord is long-suffering. I don't know how the Lord is putting up with the foolishness that's going on in our country today. But somehow, His time is not my time. His thoughts are not my thought. His ways are not my thought, ways. And so, I don't know when it's going to happen, but I do know this. that One of these days, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, Believers are going to be caught up to heaven, and according to the scriptures, there'll be a seven-year tribulation period here upon this earth while we're already up in heaven, and there are two events that we know that are going to take place in heaven. One is the judgment seat of Christ, and then after that is the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then the Lord returns. Now, if the rapture were to happen today, and it is an imminent event, it could happen at any moment, nothing stands in the way. I don't know how long after we're caught up to heaven before we start being called one by one to stand before the Lord. But it could be very quickly. We need to be ready in view of that going to happen before we know it. I think of this statement in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence before him and not be ashamed at his coming. I wonder how many of us, when that moment happens, uh, we think, in our minds, it won't be today. It'll be a long time before that happens. And then if it happened right now, and we entered into the Lord's present with a lot of things in our lives that shouldn't be there, how ashamed we would be. We need to abide in Him. That's what it says. That we would not be ashamed at His coming. And so... It's an individual event. It's an imminent event. We need to be ready for it because it could happen today. Finally, it's an intense event. An intense event. I read there in Romans, I think it was, chapter 14. No, no, it was in uh, 2 Corinthians here, chapter uh, 5 and verse 11. He talks about the judgment seat of Christ, and then he talks about, in verse 11, knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. What's he mean by that? I mean, we're saved. We, we shouldn't be afraid of being in the Lord's presence, should we? I want to remind you that Isaiah was a believer, and when he was in that vision and the temple, and he saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. He, he falls down as dead. And I remember there in Revelation chapter 1, when the apostle John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, saw the Lord in his glory, it says he fell down at his feet as dead. Make no mistake about it, friends, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I think about the disrespectful way people think about God. They use his name as a curse word. Uh, they talk about the man upstairs or the big guy. Billy Graham was uh, on a college campus once, and he was taking questions from college students. 
And one of the students asked him, what kind of a dude is God? And you just think about the disrespect and ignorance of people about how awesome God is. One day when we are in his presence, it's going to be a terrifying moment, even if we're saved, even if our sins are under the blood. I read an interesting story. Three timid women from down in the backwoods of Tennessee had always wanted to go to New York City, but they were terrified of being mugged or uh, beaten or something on the streets. They heard all these stories about uh, all the crime in the big city. But finally, they got their courage up, and they went to New York City, and they checked into the hotel, and uh, they were finally ready to go out and kind of walk on the street and see if they could find a restaurant to eat or something. So they got on the elevator about the 14th floor of their hotel. And just before the door closed, a big black man got on the elevator, and they all began to shiver and were terrified and just scared to death. And he got on the elevator, and the elevator doors closed, and the man said, sit. And they were so scared that they crouched down in the corner of the elevator, all three of them just quivering there, scared to death. Finally, they got to the lobby and the door opened and the black man got off. And they, they thought the moment had passed, they were finally safe. Later that night, when they came back to their room, they found a dozen long stem red roses had been delivered to their room. And there was a note with it and said, Please accept these flowers as a way of apology. You must not have seen my dog when I was getting on the elevator and I told it to sit. When you all crouched in the corner, scared to death, I was embarrassed and didn't know what to do, so I just got off the elevator at the lobby and left. Please accept my apology. It was signed Reggie Jackson. He was a, a right fielder for the New York Yankees back in those years, and a wonderful man. But they didn't see the dog, and he said, sit. And they were just so fearful. And you think about how scared those women were. Think about the terror that will fill our hearts when we finally are in the presence of God. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. You know, Paul said one time, I knew a man caught up to the third heaven, and he was talking about himself. And so when he said, knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, he'd been in God's presence. Even on the road to Damascus, the Lord had stricken him down with blindness on the road, and he was terrified in that moment. Make no mistake about it, it's going to be an intense moment when we stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. The certainties of this judgment. Secondly, I want to talk about the contents of this judgment. The contents of this judgment. There are three things that I think we will have to deal with. It says, by the way, in 2 Corinthians 5.10, that every man received the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And I think about this, I didn't read this passage earlier, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15, it talks about, Every man's work shall be tried as to what sort it is. And he talks about gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. What we've done is going to be tried. It's going to be tested. It's going to be revealed as to the quality of the work that we have done for the Lord. And so the contents of this judgment, I think, are going to revolve around three things. The first one is, 
unconfessed sins. Unconfessed sins. I think about the fact that we have a wonderful promise in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. How many times have you claimed this verse? If we confess our sins. Amen? If we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But I wonder how often there are sins that we harbor and we think nobody will know about them. We, we can get by with this. You never really bring them before the Lord. Or if you do confess them, you don't confess them in the way that God intends. You know, the word confess is the Greek word homologeo. It literally means to say the same thing about your sin that God says about it. You know, God says lying or cheating or stealing is wrong, but you find a way to justify your actions and you kind of sugarcoat it and calm it down a little. Well, I'm sorry about that little indiscretion, Lord. It didn't amount to much. Uh, maybe it didn't amount to much to you, but it was one of those sins that Jesus had to die and shed his blood upon the cross for. And so sometimes we, we just uh, don't confess sin at all, or if we do, we don't really confess it because we sugarcoat it. But I tell you, God is going to deal with all of those things. You know, I, I talked about the marriage supper of the Lamb in he heaven. The judgment seat of Christ comes first, and then the marriage supper of the Lamb. And it says there in Revelation 19, the bride hath made herself ready. How does the bride get ready? The judgment seat of Christ comes first. And all of these problems that we didn't deal with now are going to be dealt with then before the bride is ready for the marriage supper. And so I, I think about Unconfessed sin, Dr. M. R. DeHaan, most of you would probably know who he is. He was a starter of the radio Bible class, and they started our daily bread ministry and all of those things through Dr. Dr. M. R. DeHaan. He said, if we don't make it right now, it will, will be made right there. God is going to deal with that. Dr. I. M. Holderman, another great theologian, said, Unconfessed sins will appear at the judgment seat of Christ. He will weigh them in the scales of judgment in relationship to our works and service. And Don, Donald Gray Barnhouse said, Unsettled accounts will be opened and fully settled at that time. You say, well think I'm okay. I, I don't think I've got anything that much out of order in my life. I kind of thought about a dream that Charles Haddon Spurgeon said he had one time. He said in this dream, his heart was divided up into a hundred pieces. And each one of those pieces were defined and um, weighed in terms of what was really in his heart. He said in the dream, out of those hundred parts of his heart, ten parts were bigotry, twenty-three parts were ambition, nineteen parts were love of praise, nineteen parts were pride, twelve parts were love of authority and power. Four parts were love of God, and three parts were love of man. And he said in his dream, it was so convicting to him that out of a hundred parts, only seven of them would be acceptable to God. Now, we don't think about it that way. We, we get kind of used to our own sin and our own... Um, problems, and we don't do the house cleaning spiritually that we should. Well, one of these days, unconfessed sins 
are going to be dealt with once and for all in glory. The contents of this judgment are unconfessed sins, are unresolved conflicts. Are unresolved conflicts. Next one up there, Troy. Are unresolved conflicts. Are there problems with other believers or other people in general? that you know you ought to deal with, but you're just too proud. You'd say, I'm going to wait for them to come to me and apologize. I'm not going to go to them and apologize. That's just kind of the way we are. I heard about a fairly large church that just called the new senior pastor. And the first week he was there, the minister of music said, I, I need to have a meeting with you. So he came into the senior pastor's office and he had a whole list that he began to spout off all these things that were wrong with the associate pastor. And he started down this list, and the new senior pastor said, wait a minute, hold it right there. And he got on the intercom, and he called the associate pastor into the office. So now, with the one that was being accused in the office as well, he said, now go ahead with your list. He said, no, no I, I can't do that in front of him. So the, the, new associate, the new senior pastor said, okay, the two of you go into the adjoining office here, and I'll give you 15 minutes to work this out, and if you can't, I'm going to have to let one of you go. Well, they went into the next room, and about five minutes later, they came back in, both of them smiling, and they'd worked it out. A lot of the problems that we have, interpersonal conflicts that we have, wouldn't be that hard to work out if we just make the first step. If we'd begin to do something to resolve the issue. But so often we just sit and pout and say, well, I'm going to let them come. You know, I apologize. Those types of unresolved conflicts are going to be made right. One preacher, Dr. Herbert Lockyer, he's the guy who wrote those all books, all the promises of the Bible, all the men of the Bible, all the women. Wonderful books. I, I've enjoyed those over the years. Dr. Herbert Lockyer said, the primary function of the judgment seat of Christ is not a criminal court or court of inquiry. It is a place where disputes are settled and harmony is restored. God tells us that we are to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. But do we do it the way we should? I'm afraid in every church, probably to some extent in every believer, there are some unresolved conflicts. And when we get to heaven, um, those are all going to be sorted out because God is going to have in heaven perfect harmony. Amen? It may not be sorted out now, but it will be then. Finally, our unattended duties. Our unattended duties. It's not only what we do, but what we don't do that will be brought into question at the judgment seat of Christ. You know, every man may receive the things done in his body, whether they be good or bad. Uh, it's not only the things we do, it's even the things that we don't do that we should have done. James chapter 4 and verse 17 says, Therefore to him that knoweth to, to do good, and doeth it not to him, it is sin. And uh, he says, wherefore we labor that we may be accepted or well-pleasing to him. I read in Luke chapter 17 and verse 10 that even when we've done our best, we are unprofitable servants. Unprofitable servants. Um, I think sometimes we're busy about a whole lot of things that maybe aren't God's will in our life. I think about uh, 
in the conclusion of World War II, those who had been a part of the Nazi Party membership rolls, over 8 million people had their names on those rolls, and they thought, boy, in the early days of the war, they thought, we're proud to stand with Hitler, and we're proud to be a part of the Nazi Party, and and we're proud of what's going on in our nation. Aren't we powerful? Aren't we progressive? And then the whole thing unraveled, and the atrocities became known. And one by one, these people began to have to stand and give an account of what they'd done. The things they were so proud of, when it finally came out and their names were on that list, they were terribly, terribly ashamed. I wonder how many things people get caught up in, in all the social activities and all the uh, things that relate to uh, politics and all of those things. And, and they're, they're so proud that they're a part of those, but they're not witnessing. They're not praying. They're not reading God's word. They're not giving to the Lord's work. They're not attending God's house. They're not... Uh, uh, there are, there are believers who live like practical atheists. They would say, yes, I'm a believer, but in their day -day, daily lives, in their day-to-day -day conflict uh, uh, conduct, it's as if God doesn't matter at all. And they're caught up in a whole lot of activities and works and uh, things but they're not doing what God wants them to do. I think about uh, unfulfilled duties. Jesus said it right there in Luke chapter 2 and verse 49, I must be about my father's business. And when it comes to unfulfilled duties, uh, we need to do what we ought to do. You know, I thought about this in relationship to pastors. I, I'm just going to read you a couple of passages here. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 7, it says this, Remember them who have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their manner of life. And it talks about uh, the fact that uh, in verse 17, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they which must give an account. Pastors are going to have to give an account for the way they have conducted the ministry and ministered to the people of God. It says in the book of James, chapter 3 and verse 1, My brethren, be not many teachers, knowing that we shall receive the greater judgment. You know, the people that are involved in serving the Lord, you need to do it in accordance with His will. They that run must run lawfully in order that they'll please the one who's called them to be a soldier. And so there are duties that we have that one day we'll be called to give an account of how we fulfilled those duties. Well, we're down to the end of the message. Everybody's saying, can I hear it collectively? Amen. We're to the end of the message here. Uh, the consequences of this judgment, there are two. Number one, ashes. What does it say back there? Let's turn there as we close the service today. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12. Well, I'll start in verse 11, because here's the foundation. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, in a sense, that's what we're doing from the moment we're saved. Our life is building upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. Built upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall test every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built upon it, he shall receive a reward. That's our second. 
rewards. Rewards. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet as by fire. I heard one preacher say, you have a lot of people talk about the rewards, but we don't have very many people talk about the ashes. Uh, it talks about he shall suffer loss. Not many people talk about the loss that we might suffer in terms of a life that was wasted on things that wouldn't count for eternity. I have it written on the wall in my house, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And so we need to think about that as we go through our daily activities. We need to be willing to do what God has called us to do. And I'm hoping that maybe this message that God's laid upon my heart today about the judgment seat of Christ will help us all to think about how we're living and where our focus is and what we're doing so that when he shall appear, we shall not be ashamed before him at his coming. Father, use this message today to somehow uh, encourage your people in this congregation. I pray that if there be anyone here who's never yet truly been saved, never yet truly surrendered their life to you, that your spirit would work and convict and bring them to the point of surrender to you today. But for those of us that are your children, we pray that this would be a sobering reminder that there is an accountability that we face before you. Dr. John Walbert said, there is no more practical prophetic truth than the doctrine of the judgment seat of Christ. It is the greatest inducement to holy living. Oh, Father, help us to live holy lives. Jesus said, uh, your word says, I am holy, be ye holy. And I pray that you'd help us to that end, to honor you and live in a way that would be well-pleasing in your sight so that one day when we stand before thee at the judgment seat, there would be those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We commit it to you and ask your blessings, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.